Hello everyone and welcome to our latest Dyn webinar, an intro to load balancing with Managed DNS. I'm Josh Nason and I'm joined today by Dyn Director of DNS Operations, Andrew Sullivan, .com Man Monitor CTO, Vadim Mazo, and .com Monitor VP of Sales and Marketing, Brad Canham. Before we begin, I'm going to remind you that you can ask questions via the GoToMeeting application. You can see how to ask questions right there. Or you can also use the hashtag DNSChat on Twitter. That's again, hashtag DNSChat. Of course, you can also find Dyne and .com on, on Twitter as well, so give both of us a follow there. We appreciate it. To close up today's webinar, we're going to tell you about a spe another special webinar that we're going to be featured on next week. But let's focus on the, uh, the attention at hand, the topic at hand, load balancing. With all that said, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew Sullivan to start. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Sullivan. I want to thank you uh, for coming to our webinar today, uh, talking about load balancing in the DNS. Uh, I also want to thank my co-panelists um, for their considerable help in developing um, uh, this slide deck that we're going to present today. So without further ado, we'll just uh, go ahead. Uh, we're going to concentrate on a few things today. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about why distributing load even matters, and we're going to talk about the uh, role of the DNS in that. Uh, then we're going to move on to some different techniques and how we're going to measure the success. Uh, a key thing, of course, to do whenever you are working on any kind of changes to your infrastructure is to make sure that you measure things very carefully. Uh, we're going to think a little bit about how load comes to you so that uh, when you're you know, contemplating how you're going to uh, change your structure uh, of your services, you make sure that you're uh, contemplating the sources of that load in order to distribute it correctly. And then finally, we're going to talk about, uh, very, very briefly, we'll touch on um, uh, other levels where you want to worry about this, not just the DNS. Uh, I am Andrew Sullivan as, oopsie, went too far. Um, I'm Andrew Sullivan, as uh, Josh already mentioned. With me, of course, uh, Brad and, and Vadim. Uh, these are our contact information here, so you can get hold of us afterwards if you need to. So first of all, I, I just want to start by notice, uh, noting the, the normal thing that we mean when we talk about load balancing. So this is the sort of classic arrangement, right? You have a, a single site and you have a bunch of people coming in uh, from, the, from the internet. They arrive at your site and you, know, you originally have just one server and then you're unhappy with that so you put a load balancer in front and then you run multiple services behind it. Uh, so this is frequently an appliance or some sort of uh, module that you use um, and in any case, it's a, it's a single site. But this is a uh, particular species of load distribution. So the internet is, remember, a network of networks. And because of that, load balancing is just one special case of the general problem of distributing load around uh, the internet. So when we're talking about load distribution uh, and load balancing within the DNS, we're not talking straightforwardly just about balancing. First of all, that suggests that you're going to get the same load everywhere, and that isn't necessarily the case. You don't necessarily want that. What you want to do is align your demand with the resources you have, so you make sure that the high-capacity resources are taking most of the load. And you also want to align your resources with the demand that's coming towards you. So you want to make sure that you have the, uh, the services in the right place. So this is the sort of Goldilocks story, right? You make the demand just right. You don't want too much demand in a weak site. And you don't want uh, uh, you know, a, a, a weak site or a strong site to be serving uh, something that isn't, um, uh, isn't up to its capacity. So what does DNS have to do with this, uh, uh, with this sort of problem? We need to remember that the DNS is, is just absolutely fundamental to everything that happens um, uh, essentially on the internet. I mean, apart from connecting raw to an IP address, Almost every single thing starts with a DNS lookup, and that includes every single web impression. It includes every image on the website. It includes every link, uh, you know, every tweet, every email. All of these things start with a DNS uh, lookup. And in fact, they frequently start with multiple DNS lookups. Uh, many of you will be aware that browser vendors have already started to play tricks with this, so many of the browsers now, when, uh, when they render a page, they immediately start trying to perform all of the DNS lookups in that page in order to make sure that the uh, DNS lookup time isn't very long when you, you know, click a link or anything like that. And this can have um, big effects on your infrastructure because 
uh, what's happening is you're you're ending up having to resolve requests that are not necessarily things that are ever going to be used. You might have uh, uh, DNS lookups that end up re being resolved even though uh, nobody actually clicks on that link. So there's the, the old-fashioned and very basic way to cope with this kind of load distribution. So you imagine that you have your site at www.example.org and you know you have an A record for that, maybe you've got a short TTL, uh, but you know it's an A record and it takes you to one IP address. One very simple-minded thing that you can do to solve this is just add another A record. This is a feature of the DNS. It's been in there forever. This is always the way the DNS has worked. You can have multiple answers for any given name and type. And the key thing that happens here is that you end up balancing between these two records. So the two records include uh, are, are delivered in a different order in the DNS. It's, it's a render. DNS responses are not ordered. And that means that when it's cached, the cached server will also hand that out uh, in a random order. Normally, it'll just cycle among them. So it'll take the first one that it has, and then it will put that at the end of the list for the next um, time it uh, hands that answer out. It's a very, very simple way of solving this. And there are some advantages to, uh, to performing things this way. And the first thing is that there's nothing special about it. This is the way the DNS has always worked. So it should just work right away. It's standard DNS functionality. You can do this anywhere uh, today. You just need to stand up another server and have another IP address uh, to, to address. All of your existing tools will just work with this. Now I say that, but the fact of the matter is that we all know existing software has bugs. And from time to time, we still run into systems that, uh, that don't like this style of, um, of answer. There remain some edge systems that believe that you can only have one resource record in a response and they'll only accept one. But they're increasingly rare and uh, you know, they tend to be flaky. And in any case, um, because they're the exception, they're still gonna get the top answer. There are, I've never run into something that actually falls over in the event you give it two resource records in an answer. So, you know, it'll have bugs. It will be an imperfect load balancing solution, but it will, in fact, balance your load for the most part. Now, notice this is totally dependent on the client. The client is doing all of the work, the DNS client, and that includes the recursive resolvers that are sitting at ISPs, and it includes endpoints the clients are driving all of the load balancing here. So if you've got a very big buggy client that never randomizes the answer or never cycles through the answers that it gives out, then that uh, client is not going to be participating in your load balance uh, solution. This approach is also, for the most part, insensitive to the client's location on the network. And uh, some people think that that's a bad thing and that's why we have some more advanced approaches to this. So why is location an important thing? There are really three reasons here. The, the first thing is that on the internet, everyone is, is local to you, right? There's not, it, it isn't like um, a neighborhood kind of problem where you, know, you don't have to worry about the people across town. Everyone is local. The potential market is, of course, the whole world, but also from the point of view of the users, everything is local to them. So from, from the point of view of somebody across the globe or somebody across the uh, country, your services are supposed to work just as smoothly there as they are for somebody who is very close to you. And this is a constant problem that if people start to get inconsistent performance depending on where they are or depending on where they move to, that is, they move from the office to the coffee shop uh, and they're in a different network, uh, people get very, very grouchy about slow performance um, having to do with, uh, you know, with their network changing. They think that the internet is broken or more likely they think your site is down. And this is important because DNS lookups can travel a very long way. So in this map, we have an example where uh, the DNS server is somewhere in the uh, US Midwest and the client is doing a lookup from uh, the UK. 
So you can see that this is going to travel you know, quite, a, quite a distance and that's going to lead to some latency. So we actually um, ran some tests and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, but I just want to highlight one particular example here. This was something that um, uh, was a, a lookup that landed, uh, I think in the US Midwest, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I believe this was in the US Midwest and it, uh, it, it inc added a latency of as much as 118 milliseconds. So that's a big difference, right? You can see a, a short version on this slide, for instance, was only eight milliseconds. So that's an enormous, uh, range and therefore uh, you know considerable delay that you're adding to somebody's lookup. If this is the first lookup on your web page, then it's taking uh, it's adding 118 milliseconds before anything starts to render. Now everything can go a long way, and we're going to come back to this later. But I want to point out it's not only like you know the UK to um, uh, the US Midwest. Here's an example of uh, something that might be going from Hong Kong to uh, the US uh, Pacific coast and I of course drew it the way that was easy to draw across the middle of the map so you could see it. It might go you know, in a different direction but it doesn't really matter. The fact is that it's a long way from Hong Kong to LA no matter how you, how you count it and therefore you're going to send a lot of traffic. And in this case, in this uh, example that I've drawn here, uh, it's not only the DNS traffic which is represented by the solid line but that dotted line uh, is also you know the web traffic and so on. So if you have not only your DNS servers but all of your servers only in one location, then everybody around the world has to visit that location and they have to put up with that additional um, the, the additional time that it takes. So all of the load lands in one location. It means all of the load has to travel to that location. So the next thing that we do when we start to see this sort of problem, we start to think, oh, well, you know, I'm a US-based business. I've got some customers on the West Coast and on the East Coast. So instead of having only one DNS site, I'm going to have two. And I, I start with two. So I've got one on the West Coast and then I've got one on the East Coast. And then I start to see that people in the middle of the country maybe aren't getting greatest performance no matter what happens. So I had a third one. I, I add it in the middle of the country. But now nobody in Europe is getting good performance. So I add something in Europe. Pretty soon I'm adding servers all over the place, so in this slide I've added servers, a couple in Europe, I've got uh, two in Asia, one in Australia, and three in the United States. This is going to be pretty good coverage, it's not perfect of course, nobody in Africa is close to anything, nobody in uh, Russia is close to anything here, uh, South America is sort of on its own. And notice that some of those are um, on their own and they're behind expensive and slow links. So in this example, uh, the South America um, uh, market is very badly served because there's really nothing that is very close and there's no fast link to something that would be one more hop uh, close. So nevertheless, this sort of strategy provides you with, um, uh, with, with a gain. Instead of going from the UK to, uh, to the US Midwest, you might get lucky and, and you provide the, the service within the UK, so now you've provided a, a DNS server that is close to uh, the, the people in the UK, so likely they're going to land on that server in the UK. Now, it probably sounds like I'm hemming and hawing there a lot. I'm saying it's likely and so on, and that is the case. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but the first thing to notice is that this is the same, uh, the same test that we were doing before from that latency, and, and you can see here we have reduce the maximum latency in this case to 14 milliseconds and before it was um, you know over 100 milliseconds so that's a very very big gain and it will make a big difference if you can be close to the users then the DNS lookups don't take quite so long so there are some pros to this this is again just a standard thing notice what we've done we've just added some new name servers so we add uh, a name server, you know, instead of just having ns.example.com, we can have nswestcoast.example.com and nsuscentral.example.com, nsuseast.example.com, nsuk.example.com. That would be the way you would do this. You just add more DNS servers, individually DNS servers. There's no special software uh, for this. You have to stand up DNS services, you have to stand up physical DNS servers in those locations. But it's a standard part of the DNS functionality, nothing special about it. There are some limitations to this. 
The most obvious is that there is a maximum number of servers. This is governed by the um, number of servers that can fit easily in a DNS packet. Uh, normally, this is 13. That's a, it's a good rule of thumb. That's not a protocol limitation, but a good rule of thumb is 13, somewhere around there. Uh, another important thing to recognize here, and it's an important limitation, this is still depending on the client to pick the behavior. That is, you don't have any control over which server the client picks. Now, almost all DNS uh, clients, particularly almost all DNS recursive resolvers, will over time do round trip time calculations for uh, servers that they're using, and they will gradually figure out that there is one that is closest to them, and they will start to use it. Uh, that is only true if they get enough of a sample. So if they don't get much of a sample, like it's not a very busy site, then you know it's very unlikely that they're going to uh, pick the closest one the first time. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if you don't have a very busy site, you don't have this problem. It doesn't really matter. Nevertheless, it depends on the clients to pick this, and this, uh, this can be an issue because you don't have a way to influence the clients to pick the closest. The other thing about it is that once uh, a, a client, in, and in particular, again, when I'm talking about clients, I'm usually thinking of ISPs, resolvers. Um, when, if one of your servers goes down, or one of your sites goes down, that recursive resolver will still attempt to use that site until it gets a timeout. So there's no way for it to tell that you've taken that service out of, uh, out of service and therefore it will continue to try to use it. So what you get is a very long lag time the first time somebody tries to use it if you have to do site maintenance or something like that. So those are some disadvantages of this strategy. But again, this is a totally bog standard thing that is a feature of the DNS and it's available to you right now. So if you want to address the negative portions of uh, this, you want to address the cons that we saw in the last strategy, then you can use a technique called AnyCast. And AnyCast is a, a feature that is available, generally speaking, from uh, DNS providers like Dyn uh, and some of our competitors, of course. Uh, it is possible to do on your own, although you may not want to do it. So in case you don't know what AnyCast is, I'm going to um, describe it very briefly, but this is not really a, a, a discussion about any cast today, so I'm going to go over this very quickly, and if people are confused, I'm happy to answer questions later. So imagine we've got two end users here, represented by the um, big monitor on the left and the laptop on the right-hand side. And these are people, these are individual humans who are or eyeballs, as I guess they're often called, who are uh, sitting in different cities. One of them is in, say, Philadelphia, and the other one is in, say, Hong Kong. So the one in Philadelphia is going to talk to their ISP in Philadelphia. We call that ISP A here on this slide. And that ISP is going to resolve the DNS query that comes from that client. And it's going to resolve it by doing standard DNS resolution. When it does that standard DNS resolution, one of the things it's going to do is it's going to traverse the network so it lands at the DNS operator's router. So imagine that this is Dyn. Uh, Dyn is a DNS operator. It might land at Dyn's router. I'm going to call that router X. And router X, using the routing infrastructure of the internet, is announcing that it has a route towards this uh, server, which is one of Dyn's servers, 208.78.70.1. So that's the way that you uh, get to that, to that address. And normally we think of addresses on the internet as identifying a single machine or sometimes a single site, like when you're using a load balancer, of course. You're talking to the load balancer, and that's the public IP address. And then behind it, you have typically many, um, many IP addresses. Very often there are RFC 1918 addresses, private address space. But it doesn't really matter. The key thing is that you think of the IP address as identifying one unique place on the internet. AnyCast doesn't do that. So imagine now that we're the user in Hong Kong. We talk to ISP B, which is a, uh, uh, an ISP in Hong Kong. That ISP routes the same query through the internet, and it lands at Dyn's uh, router once again. 
Dyn's router in this case is router Y. And it also says that it can give out answers and it can route traffic towards 208.78.70.1. These two boxes that you see here that both have that same IP address are in physically different locations. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in these particular examples, the, uh, the Philadelphia um, traffic would almost certainly go to New Jersey and the Hong Kong traffic would almost certainly go to Hong Kong. So they stay local and we're using the underlying routing infrastructure of the internet instead of higher level pieces of the internet infrastructure in order to make sure that the packets arrive at the same place. As far as anyone on the internet can tell, these are the same machine, they have the same IP address, but in terms of the routing infrastructure, they're actually going to diff different physical machines uh, on the internet. Oops, sorry I went too far. So this is a, um, a, an advanced technique and it's extremely scalable. You can e effectively, you can just keep adding stuff to this uh, and a lot of the very large uh, infrastructure on the internet uses this. Um, there are several of the root name servers that uh, operate this way. Um, most of the very large uh, TLD infrastructure operates this way. So it's a, it's a proven technique. It works very, very well for the kinds of cases like DNS where the packets are very small. This would not be an effective strategy for you know, much larger kinds of traffic because it depends on the routing infrastructure. And if the routing infrastructure changes or if the routes change, then you have a, then you have a problem. But for DNS, it works very well. And so you can just keep adding servers and this means you can scale more or less indefinitely. Um, there are some additional benefits as well. Like for instance, you get you get additional redundancy out of this uh, out of this mechanism. So if you don't like, uh, if you have a problem, for instance, with uh, one site, you can pull the announcements of that site out of the routing infrastructure, and all of the traffic starts going somewhere else. And now that site is uh, it can be taken out of service without anybody being able to tell. So this is uh, unlike the case where we just added additional name servers, and if the name server went down, or if you had to take that site down that name server wasn't working and it wasn't responding so people got timeouts. In this case, you don't have that problem. Uh, so this is an advantage. You get this additional flexibility. Um, the flexibility also uh, comes from being able to shape this traffic a little bit. You get quite a bit more control because you are doing the routing for your traffic. So you, you, you have that under your control. This is, as I uh, mentioned earlier, this is very widely available through outsourcing and so on. Um, however, it does require significant expertise and it's a high initial investment. You need to have several sites in order for this to be a useful or effective um, system. And therefore, uh, it's generally speaking something that you don't want to do for a single site or something like that. Some provider or some very large systems on the internet do this for themselves but by and large, if you have a small, uh, medium-sized um, uh, service, uh, or even a very large service, but you have only one uh, such service, uh, it, generally speaking, isn't worth the investment for you to do it yourself. It is sensitive to network changes. Uh, you, you need uh, a full-time networking staff of experts uh, in order to manage the underlying network to this. This is not your LAN in your office by any means. It's a complicated piece of infrastructure. It's not even like enterprise networks with a lot of firewalls and those kinds of things. Normally you can't just buy off the rack uh, equipment for this. You need quite a bit of configuration expertise in order, to, in order to make this work. It's getting better. There are various vendor offerings that make this easier because of course a lot of it is automatable. Uh, but it is still something that, that is probably not something you just plug in and, uh, and, and run with. Finally, it is tricky to debug. In the previous uh, version, in, in strategy two, where we put a large number of DNS servers around the network and we named them individually. Um, in that case, we, we just have these, these name servers and if you want to know whether that name server is working, you can query that name server and you don't have a problem. But in, the, in this strategy, we don't have a tight binding between the name or even the IP address that we're talking to and the physical server that we're talking to. There isn't really any way to do that without knowing what route you traverse through the network. And that, of course, can change. When the routing infrastructure of the internet, most of the time it's extremely stable, but 
When it is not stable, it changes very rapidly rapidly and uh, if you're starting to have problems you need to be able to figure out exactly what routes are being taken in order to figure out how the traffic is flowing. So this is the disadvantage of, um, of distributing traffic this way. You get very very good load distribution and you get it distributed all the way around the world and you can distribute that load you know very scalably so that if you have a lot of traffic in one area you can add more services there. Um, Dyne, for instance, has added several different locations in Europe, even though these are areas that are geographically not very dis uh, distant from one another. Um, you get better service because we've got a lot of traffic um, located in a small geographic area. It turns out to be worth it to have a large number of points of presence there. But it's only worth it if you're serving a large number of different kinds of queries. Okay, so I, uh, I wanted to show some examples of this and uh, uh, show how this, um, uh, how this worked. Um, so we set up some, some, some names. We just used two names for this in order to make this uh, sort of simple and easy to, uh, to, under, to present in this sort of compressed time. Uh, we have this uh, dine.com webinar example one.com and and example2.com and the first of these is a standard straight old-fashioned unicast system for DNS so the kind of thing that you would you know set up if you just went and registered a name and set it up on the DNS servers of your registrar this is a good example of how this would work it looks just like that um, the second of these is a, a standard Dyn anycast system for DNS so I went into into Dyn's network and I configured uh, Dyn.com webinar example 2.com as a name that is served by our Anycast servers and uh, uh, configured them there. But the key thing is that everything else in these examples is exactly the same. So the, the target IP addresses, um, you know, we, we set up www.dyn.com webinar example 1.com and that has uh, has the very same A record as it does in example two. All of the zones are the same all the way through. And then we just ran a series of tests against these. Um, so there was a, uh, this is a quick heat map comparison that is based on a tool that I have here. It's a, an experimental tool here at Dyn. And it shows a little bit here to begin with uh, um, just the kinds of differences that you see. Um, you can see in the unicast uh, provider, which is the one there labeled on the left, current DNS provider, you get quite good performance in the U.S. Central and U.S. East regions, um, quite good performance on the two name servers that were set up. But in the West, things are a little bit slower, and in Europe and Asia, things are quite slow altogether. Whereas, because Dyn has uh, DNS servers all around the world, uh, you can see that results are quite a bit better in um, uh, in, in all of these other regions. In particular, things are quite a bit better in Europe, and we see some improvement in Asia. I will mention that the Asia uh, measurements in this case include uh, measurements from inside China, and there are some special considerations about the way the Chinese network um, performs that um, cause us some challenges there, and you can see it because of the red blocks on here. These are one-hour blocks, and uh, the legend is across the top to tell how long things are taking, how long the responses are taking. Um, the top row, by the way, is uh, missing some blocks because this uh, this is a, an experimental tool and it was live when I did it, so you can see that that top block um, uh, wasn't actually populated. We hadn't finished with it yet. So my colleagues at uh, dot com monitor um, uh, prepared a number of tests using their tools, and you can see um, they have some tremendous tools here, uh, and they here is an example with just one location and you can see the, the response time between these two things with the blue line representing example one and the green line representing example two and in this case there's quite a um, quite a difference in performance the baseline performance is quite a bit better to begin with because you have a, a widely distributed network and, and then on top of it all when there are uh, when there are slowdowns, you don't see the same. Uh, you, you don't seem to see the same difference. So it's not just that the um, the normal performance is better, but also when you have a problem, the problem is quite a bit um, uh, quite a bit less severe. We can also see here in a page load effect 
um, here we've measured the uh, DNS performance. How long did the DNS take? And, and what happens in this case is that the dot-com monitor tools uh, actually perform as though they are a human sitting at a web page and, and loading the page. So you can see all of the URI, uh, URIs down the right-hand side here that are being loaded. You see images and uh, so on all being loaded. Um, and then it breaks down the different parts of the page load in order to show you what's happening here. So here you can see the DNS latency on this, the, the initial time was 432 milliseconds. So the time spent in DNS is a very significant um, part of uh, how long this took. It started a uh, start time of 810 milliseconds with an end time of 1834, but before you get to there, you've got 432 milliseconds just, um, just in the DNS. When we look at um, uh, example two instead, you can see that this latency is down to 56 milliseconds. So we go from 432 milliseconds to 56 milliseconds. That is an enormous difference. The kind of difference that really makes the, the difference between your user staying on the page and your user giving up and going somewhere else. Now, it's important to recognize that I just emphasized how much of an improvement this makes, but it's important to recognize that there's more than one variable in this. For instance, when you want to uh, resolve www.dyne.comwebinarexample2.com, you not only have to take into consideration how long it took to get to the Dyne uh, DNS servers in here, you also have to worry in the case of a, a, an empty cache, this is your worst case, um, you have to worry about gtldservers.net, which is how you, how you find out where .com is. And you have to worry about the root servers, you know, which is the, the root of the tree. These are things that are outside of your control. The only thing that you can control is that last step. And this can make a big difference. Here, for instance, you can see this is the response from the root servers.net. Um, so this takes um, uh, quite a bit of time, and you get this answer back, and it is the referral. You don't have any choice. This is something that you might have to pay. There's nothing you can do about this. Similarly, here we have something that is in your control. This is the part that you control, the DNS servers for your own domain. And in this case, uh, you, you can see in those previous slides, um, the latency is uh, quite a bit improved. But it's not going to do anything about how fast the root name servers uh, work. The good news, of course, is that the root name servers and most of the TLD infrastructure is very, very good, so you generally don't have to worry about it. Now there's one more thing that I want to highlight here, and that was in this report, you could see we had you know, good DNS time and everything like that, but there were some other things down here near the bottom that are showing long times to, uh, long times to load. So that's what that big yellow arrow is. So here is an example of this uh, bgbody.png, uh, the last URI that's uh, showing there on the page. That one took quite a bit of time. It started up and then it took quite a bit of time to load. Remember that we were mentioning earlier that everything can go a long way. It's not just that solid line, which is the DNS lookup. It's also the dotted line, which is the content that you have to send. And so if you have to send a big image or you have to send a big file, you also have to ship that all the way around the world. So one thing that people have come up with, and one of the services that will do this is Dyn, and many of our competitors have it. Most CDNs use something along these lines. What you do is you tailor your answers per region. So if people are doing a lookup on, say, the US West Coast, they get one set of answers for, for the A record that tell them where to go to, to get this um, uh, web page. Whereas if they're querying from, uh, Southeast Asia, for instance, what you get is a different set of answers, and that sends them uh, the, that sends the user to a different location. So you put your content servers in these different locations as well, and that way, instead of having to traverse the uh, the world in order to get your uh, your content, you just pick it up from the local um, from the local region. Um, this is a, a rather advanced uh, feature. Generally, server load balancing, global load balancing. Um, geo IP uh, kinds of things. So these are very, very complicated topics um, and it's important to pick exactly the right strategy for the kind of thing that you're trying to do. But the overall approach is exactly the same. You try to keep people within the local region that they're, they're working. This is, notice, a little bit weird in the DNS. In principle, the DNS is supposed to be consistent everywhere and what this does is uses the ability of the DNS to give differential answers 
based on the routing information um, uh, of, of the client that is querying for the data. It can go wrong in some strange uh, ways, um, but they're all edge cases. So for the most part, this is an effective strategy uh, in the main, although it is not perfect. And it certainly will not give you something that we could call load balancing in any real sense, because it doesn't balance the load perfectly, but it does do good load distribution in many cases. So what are the next steps here? I mean, having um, talked about all of this, you know, what what is useful for your case? The first thing that I would say is that you want to measure. It's very, very important that if you're going to make any changes of any kind, you, um, uh, you use various tools that are available. And um, these links will take you to um, the DNS trace route tool and the browser test for 19 worldwide locations. These are two tools that uh, .com Monitor offers. And it'll, it, they, they will give you um, insight into what your system is like right now. The first thing to do is to measure your existing system. Get a good baseline. Get that good baseline and then try to make some changes to the system. You can look for special monitoring access um, uh, to uh, attendees of this uh, webinar uh, at that bottom link. Um, uh, .com Monitor has set up that special link so that you guys can, uh, can investigate the tools and see, see how they work. Um, so the key thing, get a baseline as of today. Use those uh, uh, trace route tools. Um, look at the DNS resolution times. See the network latency times. Those are two key things that you want to do with your baseline today. You want to measure the page load time. So it's not just the baseline of the DNS because as, as, we just, as, as you just saw, uh, the DNS is an important component, but if you, you know, make your DNS resolution time very, very short, and then you ship uh, you know, several gigabytes of data um, uh, you know, across the Pacific, that is not going to give you the kinds of results that you want. And in that case, what would be appropriate for you is a, uh, a system that gives more tailored results, a geo-based solution or something like that. Um, so you want to measure those page load times from around the world. Uh, then you can start to do some experiments. Dyn can help you. Uh, we have many worthy competitors, but I'm here um, uh, on behalf of Dyn, so I'd be um, delighted if you came and uh, tried out some of the things that, that we have to offer. And do those experiments, and we encourage you to do an experiment and measure with a baseline. As you can see uh, in our experiment, uh, or our demonstration here, you can use a dummy domain name. So you don't have to experiment with your live production system stand up a different domain name, try it out, and, uh, and find out the, the limitations of the system as you have. Then once you have this in place, you need to make sure that you do this monitoring, continuously monitor after the fact, because as your user population changes, you might discover that uh, the performance of your system changes as well. It's, it's super important to continue monitoring afterwards if you're really concerned about the performance. It's not good enough to try load balancing once. Normally when you do load balancing uh, with a, a, an appliance, for instance, the only thing you have to think about is whether the load balancer itself is absolutely overwhelmed, but apart from that, you just add another box all the time because it's always in the same site. But if you're trying to distribute load around the internet, then you need to continue continuously monitor in order to make sure that you're doing the right thing all the time. And again, that link on the bottom, uh, that's a special link so that you can uh, try out the .com monitor tools. So those are the remarks that I prepared for today. Uh, if there are questions, of course, we'd be very, very happy to entertain them. Uh, you can address them uh, to me or uh, to either of my colleagues, Brad or Vadim, and we'd be uh, delighted to answer any such questions. So yeah, this is uh, Josh. Before we even uh, get to questions, I want to give uh, Brad and Vadim a chance to any additional comments they might have had on the presentation. And uh, I know you guys did a lot of the research uh, on this, so maybe you guys uh, Brad, if you want to start, kind of some comments about what uh, what Andrew's been talking about. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Brad. So, just real quick, you know, if you are looking to monitor net network uh, resources uh, located in a load balanced environment, there are a few questions you want to ask to ensure that the analysis uh, that you get and like uh, Andrew's used here can be confidently used in performance improvement. Uh, one of them basically is, um, is there technical expertise? Um, I think it is helpful, as you know, Andrew notes, there, there's a variety of system architecture out there. 
meaning the individual circumstances you have uh, could benefit from some expertise both in the way of uh, folks with DNS and load balance uh, expertise as well as how monitoring interacts with that uh, environment. So I hope, you know, basically that this webinar is a step in that direction. Uh, but there are a few technical things also to keep in mind relative to monitoring in a um, you know load balanced environment. Uh, one of those is is, uh, is is basically is the monitoring method used a staggered or consistent method? And so what I mean by staggered, a staggered monitoring method is where the monitoring locations um, that are located around the world are provisioned based on the capacity of those monitoring locations. And then the results from that monitoring uh, are, are averaged uh, with an algorithm. So we call that a staggered method. Uh, there is another method, and we think this provides more uniform data, we call it a consistent method. And this is where the monitoring locations have uh, high enough capacity whereby uh, they aren't, um, you know, kind of leveraged based on whether they are at capacity or not. Um, anyhow, we can, there's, there's a little detail behind that, but that is something to keep an eye on. And then one one other thing, um, and I'll leave it at this, it's, it's pretty obvious, is that is the monitoring using a caching or a non-cache of, of the actual DNS process? So, I mean, if if the if the monitoring is using a um, a non-cache monitoring process, then the entire DNS resolution process propagates in each instance of monitoring, and you're going to get that level of of detail. Uh, and I should uh, one other thing is that when you look at the precision of the monitoring, like those waterfall charts that Andrew showed, um, precision basically involves the ability to display the relevant measurements, like the waterfall charts, that you, where you can see individual aspects of page elements, like the DNS time, the uh, secure lock, uh, server uh, time, connect, first byte, et cetera. And that will give you the capability, yeah, okay, if we take it back there, that gives you the capability to, in this case, for example, diagnose uh, what may be you know a, a DNS or load balance issue of, uh, of an issue jumping around or uncover frankly um, DNS or load balance optimization uh, opportunities so but otherwise uh, again I think it's, it's really helpful to have uh, the monitoring lined up with uh, the the kind of DNS and uh, load balance expertise is always helpful so Andrew, uh, kind of back to you guys. Um, well, actually, uh, do we, if we have Vadim still on the uh, line, be interested to hear any any follow up yeah. comments from uh, from him on what we've uh, seen today. Um, well, all I want to say is that uh, what we see in our clients uh, is that uh, times of the page load will vary differently based on DNS time. So in some cases, uh, you know, we can see up to up to 30% improvement. Uh, you know, if DNS works well versus if DNS resolution is low. Uh, you have to keep in mind that in example that uh, Andrew is showing, there are only four resolutions here. So there are four different hosts that are being resolved. Some pages that we will see may have up to 30 or 40 different hosts serving the elements. So the more hosts you have serving the elements, the more uh, DNS uh, uh, lookup you have to do. And if your DNS infrastructure is slow or it's slow for your end client, your page load time will vary significantly. Will vary significantly. Okay. And uh, before we get to the questions, Brad, if for those that have not heard of .com Monitor before, give the, uh, I guess, the elevator pitch and um, as far as what your company does and, and who you work with and uh, where people can see out there. Sure. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, Dotcom Monitor, we've been in the external uh, based monitoring space since 1998. We we're one of the innovators in that um, industry. Uh, we can be uh, seen at, uh, you know, www.com-monitor.com. Uh, and our focus is 
really kind of similar to Dine in a lot of ways. Our goal is to help our clients constantly improve their internet uh, infrastructure performance with uh, using external monitoring to pinpoint areas where they're, they're having errors, to diagnose those errors, and then to point out uh, with, with some of the data and some of our expertise where they can optimize and improve that performance. Great. So we have a few questions here, and uh, I will uh, lead it up to you guys for who wants to answer. Um, the first question is, when doing the Anycast, do the servers have the same MAC address? No, uh, the servers don't have the same MAC address. The, the, the way this works, it, it, it depends on the underlying routing infrastructure of the internet. So the different routers uh, that, are, um, uh, that are in charge of routing packet in a given, packets in a given region will announce the same address blocks. They say, I know how to, um, how to send data to this, um, to this address. And this works because the routing infrastructure is actually designed so that there's more than one way to get um, to get to a given destination, and that's of course advantageous on the internet because if one route goes down, you have another way to get there. So what this does is it uses that ability to say, "I know how to get to this um, uh, to this route," or "I know how to get to this destination," and you can do that from more than one place on the internet. It turns out that what you're doing is actually each one of those places is not really the same place. It's, it's, it has the same address, but it's not really the same physical machine. Uh, this is actually a separation of the, of the location and the identity, as it were. So what we do is we, uh, we use that facility, and then we just make these announcements. And then the, the routers from the ISPs, for instance, will pick the one that is shortest. They'll pick the one that is closest to them, and that's the one that they send the traffic towards. So that's how it works. It's, it's really just a trick, a nifty trick in the, in the routing system. Okay, great. Uh, next question is, how does TTL affect latency? And any suggestions on what value it should be set to? The TTL is the time uh -huh. to live, and it is a, uh, it, it's a, it's, it's really a control on how long uh, a given record should be cached. So it's going to control how long the, um, uh, the ISP, for instance, saves that record. A longer cache will, of course, allow the ISP to save the record and use it again for the, another query. But the uh, disadvantage is it reduces your flexibility. So it reduces latency because if there's a cache hit, that is, if you know, if, if you have two customers at Comcast and the first customer asks for triple w dot example dot org, and then the second customer asks for it, the second customer can ride free on that query, right? The, the Comcast doesn't need to go out to the internet and answer it because it has it in its cache. So that's the reason it reduces latency. There's no additional DNS lookup, but it, con it constrains your flexibility. If you want to change the IP address because you want to change, you know, hosting providers or something like that, you have to wait until the TTL is completely expired before your old site can be taken offline. And in extreme examples, you will sometimes see people have, you know, TTLs of maybe a week, and they try to change ISPs inside a couple of days, and they actually take themselves off the internet. I think I heard Vadim wanting to say something as well. No, I think you kind of covered most of it. Okay. Uh, next question. I think this might be for Brad, but uh, this might be related also to uh, Dine's product as well. Is, is can this system add redundancy to help with geographical internet problems? Example, rerouting people. Um, yeah, I... I, I... I, I don't think that's um, that's going to be a, a fit if I'm understanding the the question correctly. Well, yeah, this is what the way my understanding uh, it can work uh, if you have uh, is it redundant DNSs and then you also have some kind of CDN network. You can set up your uh, DNS to to uh, use a CDN network to serve proper content from the you know, closest location, but that would be a combination of DNS load balancing and then some kind of content uh, distribution network system uh, that will work uh, together. 
Okay. Uh, Andrew, anything to add to that? Uh, just a little thing. If uh, I put the, the map again up with the tailoring answers per region. So one of the features that you get when you're using any kind of uh, global uh, system, uh, any kind of global balancing system, or when you're doing any kind of uh, geo IP type of system, what you get is, is something that tries to tailor the answers for the region that the user is in. And the danger, uh, and I think this is implicit in the question, um, the danger is that what you're essentially doing is then breaking the internet up into these little regions. And if there's a problem in that region, then, uh, then th that body of users gets in trouble. So what you do in this system to make sure that that doesn't happen is you have redundancy across the regions. You make sure that you give out answers so that people can go either to, um, just to pick an example on this map, if you've got somebody who lands on the U.S. West Coast, uh, for instance, they also get uh, answers that would, would get them to the U.S. Um, Central uh, region as well. And that way, if something really horrible goes wrong on the U.S. West Coast, you still have a completely separate region that will allow those services to be um, to be handled. Uh, and that way, you don't you don't have an outage. There is the disadvantage to this that you're not distributing the load completely because sometimes what will happen is people will, by accident, they'll go to the central region instead of going to um, the West Coast region. So performance is not absolutely peak in this case. You're giving up a little bit of performance in order to get better reliability. Um, that's always a trade-off in these cases, right? Hot rods are um, notorious for breaking down all the time. If you want a daily driver, you don't, you don't tune it to within an inch of its life because it's going to be broken down on the side of the road all the time. So similarly, for any kind of load distribution mechanism, you want to make sure that you're not focused exclusively on performance and load distribution. You also want to make sure that your reliability is very high. And that's why in those measurement graphs that we saw, um, like uh, back here, I'll just flip back a couple. Um, this measurement, the, the difference between the peaks and the valleys on these two lines is at least as important as the, uh, as the baseline number. You don't just want to make sure that you've got very fast response. You also want to make sure that when things are really pear-shaped, they're, they're as you know, flat a pear as possible. You don't want things to go really badly. All right, and Andrew, would my Toyota Camry qualify as a hot rod? I I don't know, man. I mean, you could you know you could put a bigger engine in it, I guess, but probably I wouldn't recommend it. All right, very good. Well, we're just about at the end of our time. Before we go, I want to uh, give us some time for some plugs and also talk about uh, our next webinar coming up uh, next week. But before we do, Brad, if you want to give some uh, some final statements as far as dot uh, com monitor, where people can find you on social media, how people interact, any special offers, and so on and so forth. Well, I, one of the special offers we have is, is really we've uh, we've uh, tasked one of our um, DNS uh, load balance environment uh, experts here, Chris, uh, to be available uh, for the rest of this week. Uh, for anybody who wants to go through and, and use those those initial baseline tools, they're they're free. They're under tools uh, at our website dot com monitor and then just look under tools. So those are free tools that you can use. Uh, we don't ask for emails or anything like that. Um, and then there is a, uh, a special link for attendees, and that's basically, uh, you know, we basically give you the full version of the product just to set up some monitoring, get a baseline, uh, see some things you, you really just can't see any other way, uh, and then, you know, figure out from there if it's, uh, you've got room to, to optimize and and uh, kind of move forward with that regard. So that's the special offer is, is primarily um, it's it's Chris's expertise uh, on our side and Chris is connected uh, with Andrew. So uh, between the two, um, you know, these guys should be able to, you know, really take a look at systems out there and determine whether or not um, some of the methodologies talked about here today can can uh, help you guys uh, all improve your performance. Great. Uh, Andrew, any uh, final comments as we wrap it up? 
Uh, none for me. I think that uh, uh, you know this has been a very, very useful opportunity to sort of go over some of the advanced um, things that you can do with the DNS. Uh, I do encourage people though to run experiments. The, very, very important to understand the performance of your existing system and then try, thing, try things out. You can find out how those things are, are, are going to work. And I know that Dyn offers, um, I'm, I'm actually a propeller head here, so I don't know all the details, but um, Dyn offers a number of opportunities for people to play with our um, systems as well. And so you would have to contact the, the salespeople here at, at Dyn in order to learn about all of those things. Absolutely. Yeah, and if you want to do that, obviously you can uh, tweet us at, at Dyn Inc. Uh, you can drop us, uh, we have a sales contact form on our website at Dyn.com. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to get a hold of us. Um, and also, uh, a lot of people have been asking for uh, are the videos and slides going to be available afterwards. Uh, absolutely, we're uh, after this webinar. We're going to work in the next you know hour or so, getting everything uploaded. So if uh, you want to get some of the the dot com monitor links, uh, some of the information, we'll have all that stuff available on uh, on our website in a little bit, and obviously we'll share that socially as well.